Good day and welcome to Dr. Hugh Ross's Paradoxes class. Uh, it's uh, December 11th, 2022, and we're here at uh, Christ Church Sierra Madre in Southern California. Our URL is paradoxes.org. You can go there and click on the uh, highlighted line. Dr. Ross is with us today. He'll, he'll be continuing human exceptionalism probably for a couple more weeks, too. Uh, you may uh, put your questions or comments in the chat feature on YouTube. Uh, the questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. So especially for our live audience, please hold your questions until then and use the microphone right in the back of the room. We'll take turns between those online and those in the room. Uh, and that is it. Dr. Ross, please come forward. How's that? That better? Okay, let me start that again. Well, greetings to all of you that are here and present and the many of you that are participating with us online uh, from around the world. And this is December 4th. And uh, yes, we will be meeting uh, every Sunday. We will take Christmas Day off since that's a Sunday. So just encourage all of you to spend time with your families and friends and celebrate the, the coming of Christ. Uh, within the comfort of your home. Uh, so, but we will meet New Year's Day. So the only day we're gonna miss is Christmas Day. So, uh, I'll, and I'll be here uh, all those uh, different days. Well, last week I introduced the topic of this series on human exceptionalism, and I began by mentioning that uh, the three core pieces of evidence for the Christian faith is that the universe has a beginning a beginning not just of matter and energy, but space and time, which implies there must be an agent outside of space and time that created the universe. That's a feature of creation that's unique to Christianity. So establishing this establishes the Christian faith. And then number two, the Bible teaches that we human beings are exceptional, we're distinct from the angels, we're distinct from all the life on planet Earth, and we have a distinct role to fulfill uh, that God has assigned to us. Uh, and then that Jesus rose bodily uh, from the dead. And if science were to prove that any one of these three doctrines was incorrect, it would be catastrophic to the Christian faith. But the converse is also true. If we're able to prove that any one or all of these uh, uh, doctrines are true, it would establish the Christian faith. Now where I want to take you today is that within the Christian community in the 21st century, the 21st century is really the first century of the church where we're seeing uh, pastors and theologians, not just those in the liberal wing of the church, but the conservative wing of the church that are actually claiming that the Bible doesn't teach human exceptionalism. And it's basically driven by what they think is overwhelming scientific evidence that we humans are naturally descended from common ancestors with the Neanderthals, with Homo erectus, the Australopithecines, the orangutans, and the chimpanzees. Uh, that were not the result of special creation, uh, but the result of a, a descent from a common ancestor through naturalistic means. And consequently, conservative theologians say, if this indeed is where science stands, then we have to take a different position in how we interpret these texts in the Bible. And I'm gonna be spending some time in this series basically reassuring people, hey, that this presupposition that these theologians are make that we have uh, scientific, overwhelming scientific evidence that we're not the product of special creation, that that indeed is incorrect. We actually have stronger scientific evidence than ever before uh, in the history of the church that we are the product of special creation. So I'm gonna be going there, but what I wanna begin today is to dispel this new modern idea that the Bible doesn't teach human exceptionalism. And it's not just one text, it's multiple texts. But we see it right in the very first page of the Bible in Genesis 1, uh, 27, where it says, God created mankind in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And so this is an explicit statement that human beings are the product of God creating us. We're not the product just of naturalistic descent. It's God himself who created us. And he created us in the image of God. And so this is a feature that's exceptional. He did not say of the angels they were created in the image of God. He didn't say of the <coughs> uh, chimpanzees uh, or of the elephants uh, or of the uh, uh, porpoises or dolphins that they were created in the image of God. As intelligent as those a animals are, as amazing those animals are, they are not created in the image of God. We alone are created in the image of God. Now Genesis 1 doesn't explicitly uh, state what this image of God means, but at least is communicating that we share characteristics of God that is not shared by any other species of life that he's created. There's something special about us. So I think just based on this one sentence we see in the Bible, it's difficult to say that the Bible doesn't teach human exceptionalism. We're the only uh, life form that he created where he says of us that we are created in the image of God. And then it says in the very next verse that God blessed them. And, uh, you know, he doesn't say that of the other species of life. He says that alone of human beings, that we are blessed in a way. Now, he blessed everything in his creation. All of his creation is blessed. But this is the only place that where we see in Genesis chapter 1 where he, he singles out a particular species and says that he has blessed them. This implies that there's something unique about us human beings. We are blessed in a way that the other life forms that God created has not been blessed. Then it moves on in Genesis 1.28. And my point is, in the very first page of the Bible, it's making three distinct declarations about our special creation. So here in Genesis 1.28, it says, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So he's basically saying to the human species, I'm putting you in charge of all their life on planet Earth. So just like God is the ruler of all of his creation, he's actually delegating to humanity the responsibility to rule over all life. And again, we're the only species of life that has that role. No other species on earth has that mandate. It's unique to us human beings. We're exceptional in that we alone have been given the mandate to rule over all life, to manage the resources of planet earth for our benefit and the benefit of all other life forms. And he says, multiply and increase in number and fill the earth. We need to fill the earth in order to properly manage. And so something you see as you move into Genesis chapter uh, 10 and 11 is that God basically speaks to the descendants of Noah and says, you cannot stay in one place. I've given you responsibility to manage over all the life of the planet earth, over all the earth's resources, for you to be able to fulfill the mandate that I've given you uh, to your original parents, Adam and Eve, you need to be occupying the whole of the planet. You need to fill the earth in order to be able to undertake uh, this mandate. So what I want to do now is kind of segue into some specifics of this human exceptionalism that the Bible declares. And it's not just, I mean, I've been focusing here in the book of Genesis. What I want to do is make the point that this doctrine of human exceptionalism is taught in all the books of the Bible. It's not just the first page. The first page is where it begins to teach uh, this doctrine of human exceptionalism. But if we, as we move through the rest of the Bible, we see it taught over and over again. And as I've been debating with these uh, 21st century theologians who are now denying the doctrine of human exceptionalism, their focus seems to be, how can we reinterpret Genesis 1? But my point to them is that's not your only problem. You've got to deal with the entire uh, book because this doctrine of human exceptionalism is not limited to Genesis 1. And just for what it's worth, how they're responding 
to what I would see to be very difficult challenges here in Genesis 1. I mean, how can you look at Genesis 127 and 128 and not conclude uh, that we human beings are exceptional? Well, the way they're proceeding is they're saying, if we look at Genesis 1 through 11, it's filled with these fantastical elements that seem impossible to be true if we interpret the text historically, chronologically, and scientifically. But I don't know of any other passage of scripture uh, where the author doesn't take the pains that he does to communicate this is indeed history. Uh, this is a, a statement about the state of the natural realm and it is chronological. I mean, no other passage of the Old Testament has so many uh, textual clues indicating that this indeed is a, chron a chronology of real events uh, that took place. But what these modern day theologians are doing or saying is that this first 11 chapters of Genesis is not history, uh, it's not a chronology, uh, it's an ancient creation myth designed to communicate theological points, but not designed to communicate historical or scientific or chronology. But again, I think is motivated by their uh, misconception uh, that these uh, texts uh, are simply not able to be reconciled uh, with the uh, record of nature. So again, we'll be focusing on that. But let's l break this down a little bit as we go through the rest of scripture. Number one, humans are the product of special creation. And you see this in the book of Isaiah, where it says that everything that God has created, all life that God has created, is a product of his own hand. So he is specially uh, creating. Uh, nowhere in the Bible does it say uh, that we are the product of natural process. It's basically saying God is the author of all life. You see that in all of the creation Psalms. You see that in the book of Isaiah. And hey, it's simply repeating what we already see in Genesis chapter 1. And if you go to Genesis chapter 2, you see it again. What are the Hebrew verbs that God uses when it speaks about the origin of humanity? It uses three verbs. The verb in the Hebrew bara, asa, and yatsar. Yatsar is the verb that you see in Genesis chapter 2. The word bara, whenever it's in the context of human uh, God's activities, is always God creating something brand new that never existed before. You see it three times in Genesis 1, when God creates the universe. The second time in creation, day 5, when he creates the soulish animals. The third time is Genesis 1, and 1, where he creates his human beings. So it's basically making the point. The universe is something brand new that never existed before. That's the first time we see matter, energy, space, and time, and the laws of physics. Creation day five is when we have life here on planet Earth that's not just physical, it's physical and soulish. Namely that with the birds and mammals, they have features that cannot be explained by physics and chemistry. They have features that transcend uh, the matter, energy, space, and time of the universe. They have within them the soulishness which enables them to experience and express emotions, uh, to respond to commands. So they have a mind, they have a will, uh, and they have these emotions. And then it refers to us human beings, where it says, yes, we are physical, we're soulish, but we have something brand new that never existed before, the capacity to communicate within the spirit realm and actually engage in a relationship uh, with uh, God himself. And, uh, and then when it says make, uh, the verb saw, it means that God manufactures. And basically it's making the point that God takes the resources of the earth and he transforms it into something that natural processes could never do. And so a good analogy would be, what does it take uh, to make a Boeing 777 aircraft? It doesn't take a tornado blowing through an iron ore field. Uh, rather, it takes human beings harvesting the iron ore, the copper ore, the titanium, and then manufacturing it in these factories where you've got intelligent engineers that are manipulating this stuff and transforming it into an aircraft. It's something that can't happen by natural process. 
Now there is a verb used in Genesis 1 that opens the door for natural process. It's the verb hayah. But the verb hayah is never used. The verb hayah is let there be, uh, uh, let there uh, develop. Uh, but that word is never used for human beings. The verb yatsar that's used in Genesis 2 for the creation of Adam and Eve is a verb that combines the definitions of manufacture and create brand new what didn't exist before. So humans are the product of special creation. It's a doctrine that's not just taught in Genesis 1, it's in Genesis 2, it's in the creation Psalms, it's in the book of Isaiah, and you actually see it in the New Testament epistles as well. And humans alone possess the image of God. We're the only species where it says that we are created in the image of God. Humans are uniquely blessed by God. And so we see that feature in Genesis chapter 1. Humans alone ask the God question and possess the capacity to relate to God. One thing I've noticed in my debates with atheist scientists who insist that all life is here by naturalistic process they can't avoid the God question. Uh, they're compelled, I mean, they're, they're passionate about the non-existence of God. And not too far away from here, uh, we have the uh, headquarters of the Skeptic Society. Uh, they have these meetings, and they're not alone. There's atheist organizations around the world. Uh, what I find amusing is how many of them in their meetings gather together and they sing. And what they sing is similar to the hymns we sing in church, but the words are different. They're singing these songs about God's non-existence. And it's like, they simply can't avoid the God question. Uh, and so I don't see the other non-human animals uh, being concerned about the existence of God or worshiping. It's unique to us human beings. Whether you're an atheist, an agnostic, a deist, a theist, uh, or a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, we're all involved in the God question. Again, I can relate the story of what happened when I had a chance to debate Victor Stenger, the atheist particle physicist, at the International Skeptic Society Conference in Caltech a number of years ago. And uh, the whole weekend ended uh, with the debate, but everybody hung around after the debate. And uh, it's like, they just seem to not want to, because the debate was, does science establish the existence of God? And so the fact that they all hung around afterwards for hours, and as I was engaging them, I said, I've spent the whole weekend with you here at your conference, and I now have a new scientific evidence for the existence of God. And they were very curious as to what that was. And I said, well, what I've observed at your conference you had five world-renowned atheist physicists speak about the non-existence of God. And what I observed is they only addressed the God of the Bible. They didn't give any attention to the gods of the other religions of the world. Their whole focus was on the God of the Bible. The other thing I observed is how extremely passionate they were about the non-existence of this God of the Bible. I said, if they were really convinced that this God didn't exist, they'd be treating him like the tooth fairy. But that's not how they respond. Their passion tells me, their focus on the God of the Bible tells me, they really do believe that the God of the Bible exists. Their problem is they don't like him. And the response I got from all the atheists that were gathered around me after the debate said, it's not that we dislike the God of the Bible, it's that we despise his followers. And they began to tell me stories of how they'd been wounded and hurt by people who claimed to be Christians. And I said, well, most of you here are engineers and scientists and technologically trained people. Don't you think it's irrational to reject the morally perfect God of the Bible because of the behavior of human beings that he's told us in advance uh, are not morally perfect, they're morally imperfect? Does that really make sense? Interestingly, they agreed with me. No, you're right. It's irrational for us to actually reject the God of the Bible based on the behavior of his followers. But it says, we've been so badly hurt by these people, we simply can't forgive. Which reminds me of the message we heard in church this morning. 
how the way forward to peace in the world is through reconciliation and forgiveness. So I got to share with those atheists at that conference. There's a passage in Matthew chapter 7. If you will not forgive others, then I will not forgive you. And it says it's based on the principle that every one of us human beings has offended God uh, by our immoral behavior and our rebellion to a far worse degree than any human being has ever offended us. So again, you're claiming to be rational human beings. Isn't it irrational uh, to refuse uh, to forgive human beings when in fact we have done far worse in our relationship with God? And again, what was interesting from these atheists who were gathered around me, they said, we're not disagreeing with you. We're not claiming to be rational. And anyway, uh, <laughs> the conversation went on. And, uh, and, but I want to share this with you too. Some of those atheists really turned around that day. Uh, but it took time. And I wasn't there by myself. There were other people there from our Reasons to Believe organization that were engaging the atheists in the audience. And what it took was compassionately and patiently listening to their stories of how they've been hurt. And this is what the Bible tells us. If we really want to be a healing agent, we need to listen to people's hurts. We need to empathize with the wounds that they've experienced, but also share with them the way out. Uh, but you can't interrupt too quickly. But I just want to share with you, uh, there was some really positive moves that did happen uh, that day. So humans alone ask the God question and possess the capacity to relate to God. And I don't, I've yet to meet a human being uh, who hasn't asked the God question, that isn't engaged with God, at least at some level. Okay, number five. Humans alone are managers of Earth's resources for the benefit of all of Earth's life. Uh, God has basically told the angels, hey, I know I've gifted you in ways that I haven't gifted these human beings, but you're to butt out. I've given them the responsibility to manage the earth. So I would agree. The angels could probably do a better job. After all, uh, they are not, have not committed any immoral acts. Uh, so uh, they are unlike us. They're sin-free. Uh, but God, for his special reason, says, I'm going to use these human beings in all of their sin, in all of their imperfection, to manage the resources. And one of the evidences that we are sinners is how good of a job are we doing managing Earth's resources for our benefit and the benefit of all life. Particularly in the 21st century, I think it's quite evident we're not doing that good of a job. Uh, but it's a reminder that we are sinners and we're in need of redemption. And uh, Humans rule over all Earth's life. Now, what you see in the book of Job, uh, God in the last five chapters of the book of Job uh, speaks to Job and his friends and says, let me talk to you about all these animals that are here in the face of the Earth. And so you see in Job 38 and 39, he talks about 10 different species of birds and mammals. And so these are the ones that you're most intimate with. These are the ones that are where you have these strong relationships. And then he says, notice that some of these animals, like the goat, are very easy to tame. Uh, if you've never had the experience, I would encourage you, go to some place where they got these wild mountain goats. And uh, you, I think there's... Uh, yeah, Glacier Park in Montana has wild mountain. We've got to get above 10,000 feet to see them. Uh, the parks of Canada have lots of them, and there are other continents of the world. Basically, in these mountain parks, you see these goats. My personal experience is you can tame them in under one minute. Uh, they really like hanging around us human beings. They're very easy to tame, and uh, you can tame them quickly. Uh, but as you look at the book of Job, it talks about animals that are not so easy to tame, like the cow. Uh, now, have you ever been to, like, Africa? I mean, you've been to Africa, and uh, you know what it's like with uh, uh, the water buffalo. They're cows, but they're incredibly dangerous. And what we're told in the book of Job is, uh, when you're dealing with an adult wild cow, uh, you better be very careful. These are creatures that are very difficult to tame. 
um, and uh, you can tame the young ones, but the adults are very difficult to tame. But once tamed, they're capable of doing remarkable service. And so these are the creatures we use to plow our fields, and once tamed, they're great. Uh, and it goes on to give a list. And then it talks in Job uh, uh, 40 and 41 about two soulish animals that are the most difficult to tame of all. And there's some debate within the Christian community as to what these animals are. The thing I've noticed is the only people that debate who the behemoth and Leviathan are are people who live in cities uh, where they don't have contact uh, with the wild animals. Uh, but I've been ministering in Africa several times and what I noticed throughout Africa, they all know what the behemoth and Leviathan are. Matter of fact, if you go and look in Bible commentaries, previous to the time when the majority of people lived in big cities, they all knew who the behemoth and the Leviathan are. The text tells us that the two creatures are the most difficult to tame of all. And, uh, you know, having been to Africa, they say, it's the Nile crocodile and it's the hippopotamus. And if you read Job 40 and 41, these are big creatures and uh, they are dangerous. And uh, you say, well, what's dangerous about a hippopotamus? Uh, it's not a carnivore. It's a highly territorial animal. So territorial that the crocodiles keep their distance uh, from uh, the hippopotami. Because they know if they get too close, the hippopotamus is going to turn on them. And so even the crocodiles are afraid of the hippopotamus. On the other hand, the crocodiles like hanging around the hippopotamus. Why? Because they know eventually some creature is going to wander into the territory of the hippopotamus. After all, have you ever been to Africa? Uh, they easily sunburn, and so they're on the land at nighttime, but in the daytime they look for muddy water and submerge themselves in the muddy water to protect themselves from getting sunburned. And basically they got two nostrils above the surface of the water and the rest of it is underneath. And because of the muddy nature, the sun doesn't bother them. But it means, means that they're very difficult to see. And lots of animals by accident will wander into the territory of the hippopotami. The hippopotamus turns on them and the crocodiles are waiting just outside the range of the hippopotamus to get a free lunch. So... And 95% of people killed by wild animals in Africa are killed by encounters with the hippopotamus uh, and the uh, crocodile. But what's interesting about Job is it says, you human beings have even been able to tame crocodiles and hippopotamus. In fact, uh, there's a, a, a DVD clip you can watch on YouTube. And it's a family in Africa that rescued a newborn hippopotamus from its mother. The mother died in childbirth and they rescued the baby hippopotamus and they basically spent hours per day raising that baby hippopotamus and the hippopotamus became completely tame. So tame that the hippopotamus joins them for meals. Uh, so they had, they built a home with a really big door so the hippopotamus could come through and uh, the hippopotamus loves afternoon tea only it drinks three gallons of tea while the humans are drinking one cup. Uh, but it's a very tame creature. And I got to meet a guy in Florida uh, who t tamed an alligator. And uh, alligators are very similar to the crocodiles, but what he shared with me is, yes, that alligator that you see that I have tamed, I took it from its egg the moment it hatched. And I spent hours with that little tiny crocodile every single day and uh, now that crocodile uh, will obey me and uh, will receive affection from me gives me affection uh, but he says I dare not miss a day I don't take any vacations uh, from my uh, pet alligator because I know I miss a day uh, that creature will revert it's the most challenging animal to tame very few people have done it but it can be done but I love the way the book of Job ends. In the final two chapters, it makes a comment where God says to Job and his friends, you humans have been able to tame all these animals. But notice, you're the only species that can tame these animals. The rest of life doesn't tame animals. Um, now, it is true 
that we can get dogs and cats to be friends with one another, uh, where, say, uh, the older cat can get the dog to do what it wants. But it only happens when both animals are bonded to a human being. So they're both in the same home. And I don't know about some of you, we have frequently have had uh, both dogs and cats in our home. And, uh, you know, if we bond emotionally to both the dog and the cat, they will bond to one another. Matter of fact, I recall when uh, we had a dog and a cat and uh, the dog passed away. And the cat uh, was so strongly bonded to that dog, it grieved for the next 40 days. And even before the dog died, the cat would insist on going for walks with the dog. The dog would be on a leash, the cat would not be in a leash, but the cat would walk shoulder to shoulder with the dog uh, for a mile forward and a mile back. That's so strongly bonded they were. But it only happened because both were bonded uh, to us. But anyway, back to Job, God says, notice, only a human being can do this, tame other animals uh, where they will submit to them and serve and please them. And so you don't see animals that are serving other animals of a different species. It's unique to us human beings. But then there's this passage that you see in uh, Job uh, 41, uh, where God makes the point, uh, notice that only I am able to bring humility to a proud human heart. So the point he's making, because I've made you human beings, the masters of the planet, the masters of all life, you can tame these creatures, but they can only be tamed by a higher being. They can't be tamed by one another. It can only be tamed by a higher being. Likewise, you humans can only be tamed by a higher being. And he said, Job came to me for the humility he needed to have a relationship with me. You three did not. And so he asked his servant Job to pray for his three friends that they would follow his example in going to God for the humility they need. Only God can bring humility to a proud human heart. And all of us enter life with a proud human heart. And it takes going to God uh, for our heart to be transformed. And so just like it takes a higher being uh, to tame all the other soulish animals in the face of the earth, likewise it takes a higher being to tame us human beings. Humans alone are the recipients of God's grace. This is a theme that you see in Paul's writings, especially 1st and 2nd Corinthians, uh, where he makes the point uh, that we human beings are the recipients of God's grace, undeserved favor to transform our sinful hearts into hearts that are obedient to him and willing to serve and please him in love. He says the angels do not experience the grace of God. He says that the angels they're up there in heaven and they're intently observing us. So he's reminding all of us that our lives are not private. We are on stage. The angels are observing us. And why are they observing us? They're observing us to try to learn and understand the mystery of God's grace. Grace is mysterious. It's hard for us as human beings to comprehend uh, God's grace. But I remember a famous astrophysicist coming to Christ and beginning to attend this church. And he came to me after one of these services and says, you know, I got to meet this amazing woman called Grace. I mean, I've heard so much about her. Uh, she seems like a marvelous woman. How can I? And of course he was joking, uh, but he was making the point that, you know, Grace is one of the most challenging concepts for us as human beings to understand. Why do we deserve this, you know, this favor from God? And I said, it's even a greater challenge for the angels. Because we get to experience the grace of God, they get to observe it. And it's for that reason that Paul makes a statement. In the new creation, we redeemed human beings will be teaching the angels, will be instructing them, will be judging them. Why? Because we've been trained as recipients of God's grace in a way that they've not been trained. He says, yes, the angels are more powerful than you. Uh, they've been gifted with attributes that you humans don't possess. 
But the one advantage we humans have, we are the recipients of God's grace. But this is part of our exceptionalism. We alone are the recipients of God's grace. The animals don't experience that. We human beings are the ones that experience this grace of God. And as I say here in point nine, because of our experience, and you say one reason why we humans live as long as we do, it takes time to be taught by God's grace so we'll be in a position to teach the angels. Now, I'll be talking about this in future uh, parts of this series, but one of the unique features of us human beings is we experience more heartbeats than any other species of life on planet Earth, and by about a factor of four times over the species that places second. Yes, there are some species of turtles that live longer than us, but if you actually watch the behavior of those turtles, they're not doing a whole lot. They're just sitting there and sleeping and eating, and that's it. Uh, the unique feature of us human beings, God has designed our physical bodies in such a way that we can live 80 or 90 years and be very active and productive during those 80, 90 years. Look at all the work we're capable of achieving, the amazing achievements we're able to do in those 80, 90 years. And it's because God has anatomically designed us and our internal organs, uh, everything within our body and our brain in such a way that we can be incredibly productive in the expenditure of energy and work uh, for such a long uh, time. And you say, why does God gift us with that? So that we can actually live those 80 or 90 years and be amazingly productive and energetic in those 80 and 90 years, because that's what it's going to take to fully appreciate the lesson of God's grace. Now, some of us are faster learners than others. After all, it tells us in scripture, there are some righteous people that don't get to live 80 or 90 years. They're quick learners. Some of us live more than 80 or 90 years. We're slow learners, right? So, uh, and God's got a different role for every human being in the new creation. So my vision of what's gonna happen in new creation, yes, we're gonna be judging and teaching uh, the angels, instructing them. We're also gonna be rulers of everything else that God's gonna create in the new creation. And we're all going to have different jobs, which means in this life, God is training each one of us in a different way. And for some of us, it takes time. For some of us, it doesn't take much time. And so when we're together in a new creation, we're all going to have a distinct career. My career will not be the same as yours. All the billions of humans that are gonna be part of the redeemed hosts, we're all going to have very distinct uh, careers in the new creation. But God has gifted us with these amazing bodies so we can be appropriately trained in uh, just the short time we space, face here on earth. All right, I see that I'm about three minutes over. If you wanna go into this in more detail in terms of what the Bible teaches about human exceptionalism, it's covered in this book, uh, Who is Adam? And anyone can get a free chapter at reasons.org slash Rana. And also in this book, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job, which you can get at reasons.org uh, slash Ross. So we'll pick it up there next time. I'll take questions. And as usual, I'll take questions on any topic. It doesn't just have to be on uh, the subject matter of uh, today. So. Hello, Dr. Ross. Hello, Doug. Okay, I can really hear. Uh, it's good to see uh, some familiar faces here. I'm longing for the day where we're back to where we were and, and then we have more. Uh, but anyway, um, I just had a quick comment and then a question. Um, it, it, you're Here, I'll turn my mic off so you can. Yeah, there was feedback. Okay, um, several years ago I had surgery and I couldn't go out. So I'm sitting in my house with my wife wondering what I could do. So of course I, I could pray, but then I decided to go online to these Facebook chat rooms and uh, talk to atheists. And I noticed one of the ways to stimulate respectful and gentle comp, uh, reverent conversation 
was to talk about human exceptionalism. And the way I brought up the subject was, you know, maybe I'd even be humorous and say that human beings aren't animals, and then I'd have a cartoon or something. And so they thought I would just post and run like a lot of Christians do. They don't defend their viewpoint. And so um, I used a lot of your arguments about human exceptionalism and went to other websites, and this developed into conversations that would last four or five days. <laughs> and so um, if you ever want to do that, I encourage you to do that because Dr. Ross has some good ammunition. Not that we're fighting them, but we're fighting those spiritual forces. Okay, so my question, I have another comment, but I won't do it. <laughs> my question is about, you know, these beautiful, colorful photos we see from the Webb telescope and the Hubble telescope. It seems like there's so many colors. And I'm pretty sure that when we see these photos, that the, the colors, that's not what we would see with our, it's not necessarily visible light. They're filtered in some way. And I was wondering if you could comment on what those colors mean, if they have specific meanings, if it's about the distance that these stars are from or something like that. Could you comment on that, please? Thank you. How's that? Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, the James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared telescope. And so uh, you're not getting the actual colors because we can't, our eyes are not tuned to those colors. And so what they do with the James Webb images is that they will create colors that we can see. Uh, but they're faithful in the sense that when you look at the visible part of the spectrum, the colors range from deep violet all the way to deep red. Uh, and so they basically will take those same colors and shift them all in equal amount into the infrared wavelengths. And so when you're looking at these uh, NASA releases of, of James Webb Space Telescope images that are in full color is that uh, that wavelength which is closest to the visible uh, wavelength uh, they'll make that uh, you know a, a deep ultraviolet and those that are farthest away uh, they will make a, a red color and uh, on the James Webb Space Telescope they've got different infrared cameras so some are tuned to the near infrared, the mid infrared, and the far infrared. And what they do in all those cases is they take the colors that we're all familiar with in the visible part of the spectrum and they shift them into the different parts of the infrared spectrum so we can see the color distinction uh, of the different wavelengths. But I think you're making an interesting point. Those images are not only scientifically interesting, they're beautiful, they're elegant. And it's making a point that I've been communicating on my Facebook and Twitter pages is that there's not only really interesting science coming out from these images, excuse me, it's declaring that God loves, excuse me, uh, almost trying to sneeze. Uh, they're, they're communicating uh, that there's great beauty there. <coughs> excuse me. And there's three of us that reasons to believe that are actually proposing to write a book on what we call the beauty principle. Basically making the point that when you look in science, whatever scientific discipline you're seeing, you see symmetry, beauty, and elegance. And how that testifies of a creator that creates with beauty, elegance, and symmetry. And so Romans 1 tells us uh, that the, you know, uh, the creation reveals God and his attributes. And well, several of those attributes, it's a God that appreciates beauty and elegance and symmetry. And one part, part of human exceptionalism that we're going to be getting to, we're the only species on planet Earth that actually recognizes and appreciates beauty, symmetry, and elegance. I mean, my pet dog doesn't care at all about those things. It just wants to know where its food is. Uh, and you know what it can do to play that's a unique feature of us human beings that we have this aesthetic sense of appreciating and enjoying beauty as part of our uh, in my opinion our being created in uh, the image of God and now you made a comment uh, before you asked your question 
And can you remind me of that again? Maybe you can remind me. Um, I made a comment that human beings are animals. It's one of the things that not... I mean, there's that ring again. <laughs> um, I made a comment that uh, human beings are not animals. Um, and a lot of non-believers believe we are. And, you, you know, just biological uh, creatures. And so that gets them going when I claim that we're not animals. I wanted to respond to is that you made an excellent observation in that human exceptionalism is an opportunity to share our faith. You know, I made points before. It's easy to talk to strangers because everybody likes to talk about themselves. And so ask questions about people and they'll start talking. And it's a way to get a conversation started. But I love what you made the point there is that human exceptionalism is something almost everybody wants to talk about. Either they agree with it or they disagree with it, but they're eager to talk about it. And that's one of the motivations I had for developing this series, is to equip all of you to use this teaching on human exceptionalism as a way to engage unbelievers and get them to considering spiritual points that will bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. So thank you. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> Keith Wilson, New Zealand. Our New Zealand friend, yes. Uh -huh. Concerning the idea that bara in Genesis 1-1 would better be translated separate, is the motivation behind this related to an attempt to escape from the universe beginning? Yes, good point from uh, Keith Wilson. In the book that's now an editorial that I'm writing on dual revelation, they've actually come up with a title for it, uh, Rescuing Inerrancy. I have a chapter on the attempt by theologians today to claim that for 19 centuries, the dictionaries of Hebrew have gotten it all wrong about the word bara. That the word bara in Hebrew doesn't mean create, it means separate. And uh, they basically refer to non-biblical texts where that term is there. And really the concept is one of being distinctive, separate in the sense that the word is not used in a different way. But a number of theologians are actually writing papers claiming that the word bara has got nothing to do with creation. It's actually all about separation. And I've written a response to this saying, notice it, no one's ever said this until the 21st century. It's unique to the 21st century. For 20 centuries, people have understood it as create. And kind of what I did uh, in my chapter is to say, well, let's actually read Genesis chapter 1 and 2, where instead of using the word create for bara, we use the word separate. And if you do that, it's clear that it's teaching nonsense. Just try putting the word separate in and see how strangely uh, all the uh, Genesis 1 and 2 actually reads. In fact, I would say uh, the only places where the word separate makes sense if you're using the word bara in the context of a very limited human application, it never makes sense in a divine. And incidentally, there are several other words that they're also trying to claim. Those who are claiming that the word bara doesn't mean create are the same people who are claiming the word asa does not mean make. Uh, for the same reasons, as I say, if we're going to sustain a naturalistic interpretation of the uh, origin of humans as being strictly naturalistic, we've got a problem with the words uh, bara and asa and scripture. And so they're claiming the lexicons, the Hebrew dictionaries, have gotten it all wrong for 19 centuries. My point is, I don't think you can sustain that argument. All right. Steve. Yeah, did, is that on? Oh, it is? Okay. Okay. Yeah, you got to get really close to oh, it. Okay, yeah. Uh, Steve Rogstad, so I have, I have a comment and a question. So I have the privilege of working at JPL. I'm a supervisor and engineer, and I do employ astronomers. And recently I employed an astronomer uh, from Caltech, a PhD Caltech astronomer, came into my group. And she, re she just did a presentation that she's been doing uh, research at the Owens uh, Valley Radio Observatory in low, uh, low wavelengths, so, uh, you know, very um, slow or, or right. uh, low frequencies. 
and it's uh, extrasolar space weather. So she's looking at all the different stars in the galaxy uh, with you know very wide uh, dipole antennas and searching for uh, flares that are coming off the stars and then searching the planets for magnetic fields. And it was just fascinating to see the corroboration you know, with what you've said in your books, how important, you know, and how rare it is that the Earth and the Sun and how the Earth's magnetic field and the Moon interacting with that. So it was just, it was fascinating to see that presentation and just see the, the agreement in what you've been saying in your books. And oh, thanks that. for sharing so that, that Steve. Really, that was really yeah. fascinating. And the question I have is, you know, being, working with astronomers and being an engineer, I'm always fascinated by the geometry of the universe. And you, I think, last week addressed questions and, and said something about the universe not having an edge that you can see. So my question is, is trying to visualize that. If, if you were to travel, if you could travel instantaneously anywhere you wanted in the universe, would you come to the, would you, would you fold back, you know, come back to the same spot? Or would it go on forever? I mean, you've, you discussed the idea that, you know, the universe could be flat or it could be parabolic or, you know, there's different geometries it could be. Now, obviously, when the universe was extremely small, it seems like you could get to the edge of it a lot quicker than you can now. But what would you see if, you know, since you can't get to the edge and there isn't an infinite number of material in the universe, I mean, would you travel and then there would be, you know, a space where there's just nothing and you just travel forever? Or would you... Would you fold back on itself and, you know, the universe being flat and, you know, it's just maybe you could kind of shed more light on what, what you would experience if you could actually instantaneously travel and, and explore the universe. Again? Yeah, here we go. My experience is that uh, when people ask that kind of question, they want me to give them a visual picture of how it works. So first of all, I have to tell them, I can't give you a visual picture. Uh, because when you're looking at the universe as a whole, we're really dealing with four dimensions, not three. So time behaves like a fourth space dimension, which means we're not going to be able to visualize it. I mean, what mathematicians will tell you, you can only visualize phenomena in the dimensions you've personally experienced. But we can give them an analogy that I think helps, and that's to look at planet Earth and how we humans are constrained to the two-dimensional surface of the three-dimensional Earth. And we can travel everywhere we want along that surface. We'll never come to an edge. Now, in the case of the Earth, it's a closed system. So as we travel along the surface of the universe, we'll eventually wind up where we started. And that's possible the way it is for the universe. That if we were to travel on the three-dimensional space surface of the universe, we'll eventually wind up where we started. That's if the universe has a closed geometry. But as I mentioned last week, it's possible it's got an open geometry, which means it would be uh, a hyperbolic shape. Uh, and a good analogy would be a horse saddle, uh, where you have a parabola going off or a hyperbola going off into all dimensions. In the same case, as you travel on the surface of that uh, four-dimensional hyperbolic universe, you'll never come to an edge. Uh, but you're never going to go back to where you started. You're going to keep going on and on and on into infinity. Same thing happens if the universe is perfectly flat. When we talk about a perfectly flat universe, we shouldn't think of it as a two-dimensional sheet of paper. It's a four-dimensional flat system. But like a two-dimensional sheet of paper, you travel on the surface of that sheet, you're never going to come to the edge uh, because that flatness is going to extend on to infinity. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, okay, which of those three options describes our universe? What we know from our measurements is that the universe measures very close to flat, uh, to between three and four places of the decimal. And there's good theory that tells us we'll never be able to make a measurement more precise than four places of the decim decimal. We're never going to get a five decimal point measure of the shape of the universe. And so because we're limited to about four dimension, four places of the decimal, we're never going to be able to determine is it open, is it closed, or is it perfectly flat. But we do know it's quite close to being flat. But it could be slightly open, it could be slightly hyperbolic. Now if it is flat and you, and you were able to travel you know, to infinity, you wouldn't encounter the same galaxy because there's a limited number of galaxies and things. So 
if you're not coming back on the galaxies that you started from in a closed system, you're continuing to travel, but you can't encounter new matter because there's only a limited number of, ma you know, amount of matter. So what would you encounter? I mean, what would you find if you just kept going? Well, given that you can only travel at the velocity of light, that means you're not going to get any farther than the age of the universe. So if you want to go way, way out there, you've got to wait a while because it's going to take time to travel there. So, I mean, if you could travel at infinite velocity, now the, your question uh, has uh, a point, but we can't travel at an infinite velocity. Yeah, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work, but we do know that the universe of today uh, is much bigger than the universe we see through telescopes. So we know that it's at least 96 uh, billion light years across. So we can go out that far. If you want to go farther, you got to wait. Uh, Hugh, this one's a little vague. It's from David. Give it a try. If not, I'll ask David to send it again. But he says, when you talk about Genesis 1 stating four initial conditions of early Earth, and then it gets 10 out of 10 sequences creation events correct, is this list somewhere in consolidated form? Yes, where you will find it in written form and some uh, details in the book Navigating Genesis. And it was referring to as an argument I make in that book that in Genesis 1-2, uh, it tells us the four starting conditions for planet Earth. It tells us that the early Earth begins with water over the whole surface of the Earth. It's dark everywhere on the surface of the Earth and it's empty of life and unfit for life. But then the Spirit of God begins to work. And what happens uh, following uh, Genesis 1-2 are the six days of creation in which you can determine uh, that the author gives us the highlights. It's not giving us a complete picture of what God did. It gives us the 10 highlights. Uh, but those 10 highlights are correctly described and in the correct chronological order compared to what we know from the book of nature. So the argument I was making in Navigating Genesis is the Bible gets a perfect score of four for four on the initial conditions and a perfect score of 10 out of 10 on the events that it mentions in terms of their description and the chronological order in which they occur. And I compare it with the best uh, creation story that places second. And that would be the Babylonian creation story of the Enuma Elish. It gets two out of 14 right. Uh, and you say, what about all the other creation stories? Non-biblical creation stories, they all score zero. The Enuma Elish gets two out of 14 right. But the Bible stands alone in getting a perfect score. So that's all in Navigating Genesis. And in Navigating Genesis, I also take you through the Enuma Elish and show you what it gets right and what it gets wrong. A lot of people have this idea uh, that the Bible borrowed from the Enuma Elish, but the fact that the Enuma Elish gets such a terrible score tells us that's not what happened. Uh, that there are far more differences between the biblical account and the Enuma Elish than there are similarities. Okay, Doug has another question for you here. I have so many questions, but this will be my last question today in fairness to the class. All right, are you next? I'm sorry. Okay, well, anyway, about the, the universe, we've been taught by you. Um, I believe that the universe has an end. It's not going to go on forever. Because the, uh, I forget the, the term for the matter, but the, the kind of tangible matter that we're familiar with, it's all going to come to an end. The, all, for example, all the stars are going to either burn out or go into black holes or something like that. So my question is about the dark matter and the dark energy. Will that remain after that matter that we're familiar with is gone? Is that what you mean when you say the universe is going to end? Or is like all the dark energy and dark matter going to disappear? Or do we know? And also, I wondered if the dark matter was created and dark energy was created with the Big Bang. What do you think? OK, uh, will the universe ever end? Well, if we take God out of the picture, you know, just say God created the universe, and he just lets the universe run, will it ever come to an end? 
Astrophysicists debate that question. There are models of the universe that say it will come to an end, that it'll disappear into a singularity sometime in the future. There are other models where it say, no, it's going to continue on forever. But in those particular models, all the stars burn out, the galaxies burn out. Uh, you get what's called the heat death of the universe. So the universe still exists, but everything in the universe is the identical temperature. And where everything is the identical temperature, that means there's no heat flow from hot bodies to cold bodies, which means no work is possible, no life is possible, no consciousness is possible. And then there are models of the universe uh, where they say, well, with dark energy, the universe not only expands, it expands at a faster and faster rate. And so in some of those models, they have the universe eventually expanding so fast that it tears apart the fundamental particles. And so electrons can't exist, protons, they get ripped apart. If you want to read about the details of that, I have an article I've written called Giving a Rip About the Big Rip. And the big rip is a point in the future where literally all the particles uh, cease to exist. But even in models of the universe where you don't get a big rip, if you wait long enough, all the protons decay. Now, if you live to be about 100 years of age, one of your protons in your body will decay. And uh, that typically isn't going to do much to you. Uh, a whole bunch of them decay. Yeah, it'll kill you. But a time is coming in the future when all the protons uh, will decay. That's when the universe gets to be 10 to the 32 years of age. Uh, you're going to see virtually all the protons decaying. So uh, there's a paper written in the Astrophysical Journal by the famous American atheist uh, Lawrence Krauss, uh, where he talks about the future of the universe. And basically he concludes, whatever scenario you put on the universe from a naturalistic perspective, it ends in utter hopelessness. And so he's basically making the argument that if you actually look far into the future, we human beings have utterly no hope, no purpose, and no destiny. Uh, and I've, I've cited that paper in a couple of my books because it says, yeah, from an atheistic perspective, the future doesn't look too good. Now what the Bible tells us, whatever model of the universe you've got out there, a time will come when the universe from God's perspective will have fulfilled its purpose. And when that happens, he replaces the universe with a brand new creation. He spoke the universe into existence. A time will come when he will speak it out of existence. So don't get too comfortable here on planet Earth. A time will come when this Earth will no longer exist. The universe won't exist. The sun won't exist. And the Bible tells us when that's going to happen. It'll happen when the full number of humans that God intends to redeem have been redeemed. When that happens, the universe will have fulfilled its purpose. God will have no more need for it. He'll replace it with a brand new realm, which is described in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. And what you notice about those last two chapters, the new creation is radically different from the universe. This universe is governed by gravity, thermodynamics, electromagnetism, and the strong and weak nuclear force. None of those laws will exist in the new creation. There will be no decay. There will be no death. There will be no pain. That's what you get from gravity and thermodynamics and electromagnetism. Or to put it in the words of Jesus in John 16, 33, in this world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. As long as we're in a universe, with gravity, thermodynamics, and electromagnetism, there will be tribulation. So sometimes I'll uh, paraphrase that sentence. In this world, you'll have gravity, thermodynamics, and electromagnetism. But take heart, I've overcome thermodynamics, electromagnetism, and, and gravity. And uh, I mean, all of us are living evidence of the tribulation we suffer under gravity, thermodynamics, and electromagnetism. I notice that all of you are beginning to approach my age. And what happens when you get older is that your chin begins to sag and other parts of your body begin to sag. And electromagnetism causes your hair color to change. And so look around you. We're all experiencing the tribulation from gravity, electromagnetism, and thermodynamics. And the new creation, you won't have to worry about any of that. Uh, no more sagging chins in the new creation. 
uh, no more bald heads, no more gray hair. Uh, everything is going to be radically different. Why? Because there's no possibility for sin and evil in the new creation. The primary reason God made the universe the way he did is because he made it as a tool to eradicate all evil and suffering. But when evil and suffering are no longer a possibility, we don't need all these stars and galaxies. We don't need the sun. And it tells us that explicitly. In the new creation, there will be no sun. God's going to replace that with a different kind of light. And for what it's worth, in the new creation, we're all going to glow with light. And so we talk about halos, our entire body will be like a halo. It's going to be wonderful engaging one another in the new creation. If you want to read more about this, it's in my book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. All right. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Craig McMahon, you have indicated most phyla were created during a time interval of about 410,000 years. However, I was watching a PBS showing indicating some species came into existence after that time and went extinct. This suggests God has continued creation of new species over extended periods. True or false? Let me turn my microphone. It is true that we're seeing new species, uh, new genera, uh, new families of life uh, that appear after the Avalon and uh, Cambrian explosions. So God has been active in creating right up until he created Adam and Eve. The point I was making there in that talk is that when it comes to phyla, it looks like there hasn't been any new phyla since the Cambrian explosion. They used to think the Bryozoa was a new phylum that showed up about 75 million years after the Cambrian explosion. But you'll find an article on our reasons.org website where they basically came up with a discovery, both in Australia and Africa, saying the Bryozoa are there right at the base of the Cambrian explosion. And as a number of uh, paleontologists have commented, this is a challenge to naturalistic evolution because naturalistic evolution predicts that the proliferation of species will lead to the proliferation of genera, then families, then orders and classes, and last of all, phyla. The problem is in the fossil record, we see the opposite. The proliferation of phyla happens first. The proliferation of species happens last. Moreover, when we do see phyla coming on the stage, they all come at the same time. So the uh, 50 phyla that appeared at the base of the Cambrian explosion, they all appear uh, simultaneously at the very beginning. Our own phylum, we're part of the chordate phylum. The chordates were there at the very beginning of the Cambrian explosion uh, 539 million years ago. And probably that documentary uh, that he was seeing maybe a little bit out of date because if you were to look at a documentary that's say produced two years ago or earlier, uh, it would be saying the Cameron explosion is 543 million years ago. New research tells us it's 539 million years ago. That same research tells us that instead of the time window for all these phyla showing up is within a five million year period, we now know it's less than 410,000 years and it may get even narrower. And what I find really fascinating as a physicist is to see that all these phyla show up the moment that oxygen reaches the minimum level for their existence. There's no time delay between the oxygenation event and the appearance of these phyla. Hi, Hugh. Uh, I wanted to follow up a little bit on what we were discussing on a few minutes ago on traveling in a straight line to the edge of the universe. I just wanted to bring up the fact that, in, bring in uh, general theory of relativity of Einstein, which of course tells us the space curves. So I, I, I just, I, I, with, with that in mind, is that really telling us that we can't travel to the edge of the universe? The space curves and, uh, anyway, that's, that's my question. get my micro there we go um, the, the term traveling in a straight line might be a problem if the universe is perfectly flat 
and yet we're trying to get to point A as quickly as possible, we go in a straight line. But if the universe has a curved uh, geometry, either closed or open, you're not going to be traveling in a straight line. Same principle if you want to travel from Los Angeles to Paris. The shortest distance is a curved line, not a straight line. But in all cases, uh, you're only traveling along the surface of the universe. So no matter what the shape of the universe, you're constrained to travel on the surface, which means you're never going to get to the edge. Every just to put it another way. <laughs> and uh, that you were uh, uh, talking earlier about the training of species. And uh, that, that, uh, that a species can only be trained by a species that's on a level above yourself. And I want to, want to address that to a very practical issue of us today in our relationships with others. The, how we may, in, in, um, uh, uh, where we have co conflicts or disputes, maybe we're maybe we relying too much on our personal um, uh, on our personal influence as opposed to going going to God in prayer because so th th that is I mean we're trying to teach ourselves I guess we do that in some sense but th that the idea is is that uh, that, that uh, uh, in that, that final teaching we need to rely on this power above us that's Good point. In fact, that was part of the sermon we heard from Josh Swanson this morning, is that uh, in referring to the book of Isaiah, where it says the nations of the world will never make war with one another. They're going to be turning uh, their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And uh, they're going to be going to God for the resolution of their conflicts. Well, I think you're making a good point. We don't have to wait until Jesus Christ returns here to planet Earth, we can go good to go to God with our conflicts and seek resolution. And so if we got a problem uh, with another human being, a good way to try to resolve that is say, well, let's go to the one who's above us, who really understands our problem way better than we do, and ask him uh, for the wisdom. So in that sense, we don't have to wait for Jesus Christ to be ruling in downtown Jerusalem. We can go to him right now uh, through the tool of prayer. And so, and the greater the conflict, the more we're in need of that prayer. And I think you see that particularly in James chapter 5, where it says, hey, if you want to be healed, and there's talking about the physical healing of our bodies, but I think it's also referring, if you want the healing of your relationships with one another, come to the elders and confess your sins. It's through the confession of your sins, you're going to see a pathway to the healing of crucial relationships in your life. I've talked about this before because we had a whole series on prayer a few weeks ago. If you missed that series, uh, you can download it uh, from paradoxes.org. I think you can also download it uh, from YouTube. Hello, Hugh. I recently had a conversation with a friend who argued that uh, you can be a Christian and you can have morality without Christianity. You certainly that's a good point because there are lots of examples of moral behavior and conversely there are laudable examples of uh, morality among non-Christians. So the question is where does morality originate and how can Christianity claim it as a core value? Okay, really good question. I mean, how can you claim morality is from God when we see people in non-Christian religions exhibiting morality? Well, I would take them to Romans chapter 2, uh, where it basically says all human beings are morally imperfect. All of us have sinned, but that God has given the law to all human beings, not just to the Jews. And basically makes the point in Romans 2, God has written his law on the heart of every human being. And so all of us know right from wrong. Now, some of us, because of our immoral behavior, we are less sensitive to what's been written upon our hearts. And so I think what Christianity is going, got going for it is it's much more explicit in the scriptures about what exactly that moral standard is. And by trying to live up to that moral standard, we become more sensitive to the law that's been written upon our heart. 
I mean, a good example of a, a counterexample is what we see in the book of Exodus, where he got Pharaoh, the ruler over Egypt, hardening his heart against God, and he becomes less and less sensitive as a result of that persistent rebellion uh, to the law that's been written on his heart. And so, yes, uh, we shouldn't be surprised uh, that morality is ubiquitous uh, because God's moral code has been written in the heart of every human being. But where do we see that moral code uh, written in its most elegant and beautiful and comprehensive form? It's through the Christian faith and the words of the Bible. One more question One more from question. the audience here. We've in the last few years have suffered, or at least some of us suffered from depression because of our circumstances. I just got finished reading a book by Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. And he said that those who, who survived were the ones that had, had put meaning in their life and those that gave up they eventually end up dying but he, he brought out the point that it wasn't just in the concentration camp but it's a it's a problem in in the world it, itself and so would that be another factor uh, because there's there's search for pleasure and there's search for power but the basic is the search for meaning yes I think you're making an excellent point there and you know tomorrow my wife and I are going to be taking David and Liz Block uh, down to San Diego. Uh, David and Liz Block, uh, David is an astrophysicist uh, and uh, he's been going to be with us for a month uh, as a visiting scholar at Reasons to Believe. I've known him for 39 years. He speaks all over the world about the scientific evidence for the Christian faith. Uh, but uh, he came to Christianity being raised as an Orthodox Jew and found Christ. Same thing with his wife, Liz. She too was raised an Orthodox Jew and uh, became a Christian. And uh, David lost a lot of his relatives in the Holocaust. And so we're taking him down to interview a Holocaust survivor that lives in San Diego. And, uh, and what I've heard about talking to people who have survived the Holocaust is that the key was hanging on to hope. That the people in those Nazi death camps, once they lost hope, they didn't make it to the gas chamber. Uh, they died before getting to the gas chamber in most cases. And uh, that's true of all of us. When we actually lose hope is when we no longer are sustaining the physical well-being of our bodies. And so, and it's also the point that Victor or uh, Lawrence Krauss made in the Astrophysical Journal article. If you really interpret reality from a non-theistic perspective, we have no hope, we have no purpose, we have no meaning. And uh, if that's the case, we're no better off than a piece of sand or a rock. And uh, so what's the purpose of trying to continue living? Uh, but typically when people give up hope, my mother uh, was a nurse, and she said the same thing. When her patients gave up hope is when they passed very quickly. Those who retained their hope were able to keep going and survive. And so hope is crucial, but where does hope come from? Hope comes from God. It only comes from God. So with that, let me close our time of prayer. Okay? And uh, we have more questions, but we'll take those up next week. Father in heaven want to be especially grateful uh, for being alive in the 21st century when you're revealing yourself in really remarkable ways and giving us tools to puncture through the pride of people who have not yet submitted to you as creator, Lord, and Savior. Father, during this uh, season of Christmas, I pray that you'd make us sensitive to the opportunities we have to discuss the real purpose of life, the meaning of life, the hope of life, and how we have that because you, the creator of the universe, humbled yourself, came to earth as a baby. And the uh, Lord demonstrated an example of moral perfection before all of us. So Father, I pray as we celebrate the birth of you coming here to planet earth, uh, we would also come to recognize that you're the only real source of hope 
and purpose and destiny. And may we see many coming during these next few, few weeks to faith in Jesus Christ as Creator, Lord, and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.